Uh, welcome to Network Capital, Dr. Tarur, and thank you very much uh, for writing this book, The Less You Preach, The More You Learn, Aphorisms for Our Age. When I read it, it reminded me of Kevin Kelly's book, which is uh, you know similar in some ways. He talks about the advice that he'd give to his younger self. Um, but today, I'm going to ask you to reflect on some of the quotes that spoke to me and you know from the feedback that we got from our community members. Feel free to draw upon geopolitical examples or examples from you know uh, anything that you find uh, interesting. Um, to begin with, Kofi Annan, one of your mentors, said that uh, never hit a man on the head if you have your fingers between his teeth. Tell us why you included it in the book and what this means. It, it was something that struck me as a very, very clever way of expressing a, a common predicament in many situations where uh, you find that you have to uh, uh, be tough on somebody whom you need and to whom, on whom you're dependent or, or to whom you're vulnerable. And you allow yourself the gratification of that moment of toughness or standing up against that person. And then you realize it's going to cost you in other areas that matter to you. The issue came up when um, there was an issue between us and a permanent member of the Security Council. And um, I think I innocently asked Kofi Annan, so why don't we take a tough stand and tell them where to get off? They're wrong on this. And he said, as my father said, never hit a man on the head when you've got your fingers between his teeth. In other words, you hit him on the head, his teeth clamp down on your fingers, your fingers are gone. That's the, that's the essential thing. So your vulnerability uh, becomes the, the reason for you to modify your instinctive behavior with someone. I thought that's something that if people thought about, they'd find interesting. I reckon that this is uh, also relevant when we look at some geopolitical relationships uh, that are taking shape. But would you agree? Would you want to reflect on that today? Yeah, because, you know, many countries... Um, are conscious of their vulnerabilities and their dependencies on others. And that moderates and in, even inhibits their behavior with those people. You can't expect a country, for example, dependent on U.S. aid, for argument's sake, to um, disagree too vehemently with the U.S. Uh, you can't expect somebody to um, take a stand on, on an issue which, um, which perhaps matters to some degree on some issue of their domestic concern but um, which could affect their foreign relations in areas that affect them in other ways. All of these things countries do, in fact, uh, worry about when they are dealing with someone. I've often pointed out at the UN Security Council, every country has one vote, but there are 14 countries that were very conscious of their bilateral relationship with the 15th, and that was the United States. So they didn't likely oppose something the US wanted in those days of unipolarity. No, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, with that said, tell us a bit about how this collection of uh, quotes and life advice came into shape and who is this wonderful gentleman, uh, Joseph Zacharias? Well, what happened was, you know, my publishers, David Davida, have been asking me for years to come up with a book of aphorisms because he felt that I often express certain ideas and aphorisms in my own writing and speeches. Mm -hmm. And I've sort of dithered. I had always other writing projects in mind and you know, to sit down and find the kind of calm and reflection to do this um, just didn't seem to me either feasible or a priority. Until suddenly one day out of the blue, my friend Joseph. Now, Joseph was somebody who had worked for me for a term, my first term as an MP in my Trivandrum office, had then retired to the hills and, you know, built himself a cottage there for this, with his wife and was busy um, uh, growing sort of vegetables and fruits in the wild kind of thing. Really idiosyncratic and somewhat even eccentric character, but he would pepper me with words of advice long distance, even while no longer working for me, um, by email. And so I had all these wonderful emails of advice. I once said to him, why don't you put all this together? You'd be sort of a modern day Chanakya, all this advice you've been giving me about politics, particularly insights into Kerala and everything else. Plus he'd worked in the Delhi government for many years and he had insights at the national level too. So I said, why don't you do all that? And he never got around to it. But suddenly out of the blue, Joseph sends me uh, a manuscript of aphorism saying, this is what I've been doing. I've been thinking about this each time with my morning coffee and I jot down my thoughts and here they are. So I said, great, you know, this gets David off my back. So I sent Joseph's manuscript to David and said, look, I couldn't do it, but here's somebody who has. But David read the manuscript and said, I like half the aphorisms, more or less, but half of them are not publishable. So he said, why don't we go back to the idea I first had of you doing a 
at least half a book now, and you do it jointly with him. So I said to Joseph, it's your call because it's your work. And you're perfectly entitled to uh, insist on holding on to everything and submitting it to another publisher. You don't have to be married to my publisher. <clears throat> but if you want to offer it to my publisher, he wants me to do the other half kind of thing. And Joseph didn't hesitate for a second. He said, I'd love that. I'd be honored, et cetera, very kind. And so um, he left that to me. And I took a couple of months to find the time just to reflect on what to include. Um, so there's some aphorisms from um, uh, my own speeches. I speak far too much. It's good for me. And some of them have come from there. Um, there were some from my writings, including a couple going as far back as my book, The Great Indian Novel, 30 odd years mm. ago. Um, and then the rest um, really were my own reflections, often on the kinds of topics that Joseph had also offered reflections on. And we didn't necessarily always agree all the time. And for example, one of his mm. aphorisms in the book is, I never drink with the boss and don't carry his bags either, which is Joseph's lesson from his years in Indian uh, government service. Was I My service was at the UN and I did drink with the boss, uh, with Kofi Annan. He even cooked me and in weekends worth of meals because he'd invited my family and me to come and um, spend a weekend with him in the country. So it was a different kind of relationship. Um, and so I didn't quite accept the logic of that, but I left it in there as emblematic of a rather important message that might be significant for Indian readers. Don't get too familiar with the boss uh, and don't be too subservient either. Find the right, right level. It seems like a really interesting collaboration of a former colleague, uh, you know, who was uh, who was working with you, who you you know, obviously enjoyed and has become a friend, which is why the quote of the friendship. I wasn't sure who it came from, but it says that all my good friends left me one by one. Now the only good friend left with me is myself. That was so, Joseph. He is so, a bit of a winner too, so that comes straight from him. I'm fortunate that I still have very good friends scattered around the world, alas, not all living in proximity to me, but I do have friendships, which I'm proud to say have continued in some cases for half a century. So that's always good to have. Yes, which is why I was so surprised that I think, Dr. Thru, you would not be short of friends. Uh, one is interviewing you right now. But, uh... <laughs> you know, um, uh, David Davida decided, much though Joseph wasn't keen on it, to put a little key at the end of the book, identifying which quote comes from whom. So right. ever, you can always go back and see, this is by so-and-so and this is by so-and-so. Now, in some cases, just for editorial reasons, I've edited some of Joseph's quotes. So there may be one or two where my contribution has been shaping a language, uh, but may not necessarily represent the full idea. But the whole idea of a book like this was, it represents two people's thinking. We're sharing it mm -hmm. with the world. Take what you like and what you enjoy and what you agree with. Yeah, Joseph uh, seems to be one among a long line of very successful alumni who've come and worked with you and gone on to do remarkably interesting things, set up institutions and so forth. Uh, but you say that aspire to set up institutions, not to run them. Why? Again, that's a Joseph one. So you picked a lot that came from his uh, pen. Um, I think I really should get you to compliment this interview with another interview with him, where you can ask him about this one. <laughs> and any others that you're going to come up with that he wanted. Um, I think that what he meant with that is that people who have a vision can set up an institution, but people to run them need managerial competence, administrative competence, and the two don't necessarily go together. If you look in your own world of the private sector and global initiatives, how many founders from Google to Uber are actually running those enterprises? They either had to find um, a professionals to do it, or if they tried to do it, they got very quickly ousted by their boards because they weren't making enough money or doing a good enough job ministering it. And that often happens uh, to businesses and, and, and it, it happens to institutions as well. So to set up an institution, you need a vision. To run it, you need a different kind of set of abilities. And we have both great, but many people don't have both. When you look at India, there have been many leaders who shaped the course of our country. And, uh, you know, you've written extensively about the ideas of India that have become very popular. They're now in textbooks. People refer to them in debates and so forth. Um, let me start with a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. One is that, does history teach us the wrong lesson? And why is it important to remember today? Well, because, you know, one of the things that I've always been critical of is that um, because the British East India Company came to trade and stayed on to rule, our nationalist leaders were instinctively suspicious of international capital, 
forget network capital, they weren't interested in, in internet network at all because mm -hmm. they suspected that the capitalists were saying they wanted to trade, but they really intended to stay and rule you. And so that suspicion of capital is an example of how history can teach you the wrong lessons. Yes, if you follow history, you'll say, my God, we were vulnerable to the British East India Company. We can't let that happen again. But if you don't just follow history, if you also understand that history can change, times change, uh, and you were simply prepared to not allow to, this to happen to you again, then the whole issue would have been academic. I see. So that's, uh, that's important. And you think that are the ideas of India that you espouse to your writing and to your talk is still relevant today? It seems that uh, the idea of India as an ever, ever land uh, seems to be questioned by many in the country and outside. Yes, that's true. Um, it's been questioned, I would say, my dear uh, Utkarsh, uh, it's been questioned because uh, people um, have have either got an atavistic view of India, that is, everything great was done by, um, uh, you know, the people uh, of the Vedic era, they found everything, they discovered everything, they knew everything, uh, and that kind of view. Or there are those who say that, um, you know, India is new, it's a new creation, we've tried to make something afresh and so on. And the problem with this is that uh, very often, it seems to me that we have, um, we have overlooked the fact that India ultimately is a timeless country, which has in many ways always been there, and that this, this, this land has gone through various versions of itself, but it's always been what it is fundamentally. That's what I meant by Never Ever Land. And you've gone through some, uh, I'm switching gears left, right and center because the book covers so many uh, topics and uh, nuggets of advice. So bear with me for that. But I want to move to uh, grit, resilience and actually managing difficult times. You have gone through a fair amount of ups and downs in your remarkably successful career. But uh, you've probably not let uh, uh, the sharks see you bleed. Tell us why and how is that manifested? It's another Kofi Annanism. Yeah, actually, that one took me a while to understand because when he mentioned it to me, he was going through a very rough time. Uh, he was being attacked uh, by very prominent member states and its, its various institutions. Um, and I have to say that um, that um, uh, he recounted this again, saying of his father's from Ghana, old days, if the sharks bite you, do not bleed. And I said, Kofi, I don't understand that. If the sharks bite you, of course you'll bleed. I mean, how can you not bleed? And he said, Shashi, one day you'll understand uh, what I mean. And he didn't explain himself beyond that. And it took me my own Agni Pariksha as in Indian politics to be able to understand exactly what he meant. Because when I went through hell in this country, uh, much of the time, death of my wife and the, and the, the, the attempt by some malicious people to exploit a human tragedy for their political benefit. Um, that's when Kofi's wisdom came back to me. And what some people were kind enough later to describe as grace under pressure wasn't particularly uh, any sort of Western idea in my head. It was very much the idea that as far as uh, I was concerned, I'd realized the wisdom of his saying, the sharks were biting me in order to see me bleed, in order to see me suffer. And if I allowed them to define me, I would be actually giving them a moral victory. Whereas I knew I had not only had a clear conscience, but I knew that everything they were saying was either false or deliberately invented in order to be malicious. And I could not give them the satisfaction of bleeding in front of them. And so I stayed calm. I stayed uh, focused on my work in Parliament, my speeches, my writings. I continued my, I made my Oxford speech while all this was going on. I, I, I wrote books. In fact, and some of my most successful books were written at a period when I was under this terrible cloud, uh, an era of darkness in, in 2016. Um, Why I'm a Hindu, which came out in early 2018. These were amongst my most su successful books of all time. And they were written when, when uh, I was in some ways seeking refuge from the horrors of what was going on in my, in my life and around me uh, by focusing best on who I was and what I was capable of doing. So it was the business of being anchored in myself that I was trying uh, to achieve, which is what Kofi really was and, and did when he was beleaguered. So it was a very, very useful advice indeed. 
But uh, I mean, if you don't mind my double clicking, what advice do you have for young people who feel that you know their life is being turned upside down? They just can't deal with uh, whatever's going around. Did you do something very at a very practical level to segregate like the pain that you were going through with the malicious the maliciousness all around and the work that you have to get done? Focus on things that um, have nothing to do with the accusations against you or all the problems, whatever it is that you're going through. Um, focus on the things that you know you're good at, that you know you can do justice to, despite all this nonsense. Uh, and 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 try and try and and go ahead and make it work. In my case, um, things did work. I mean, I did write successful books. I did make well-received speeches. I did intervene in Parliament in major debates. I did win. Uh, uh, my first re-election uh, with this cloud over me, all of which uh, took a lot of doing and all of which could have gone wrong. But it was for me morally necessary not to give in uh, to the to the evil that was being inflicted upon me. You say that uh, the bond of shared suffering can be turned into the most potent force in the world. I think it's true at a personal level as well as a uh, communal level and at, at a at a different multinational corporate level. You want to expand on that, what you mean by it? You did it perfectly. That's exactly what I meant. That's exactly what I meant. It can be at all levels. That, you know, in other words, it's a force multiplier to have a bond like that. Yeah. And we, we see it like, you know, um, there's a lot going on in the international context, like, you know, India, Canada, and the recent attacks in the Middle East. And uh, one can't help but go back and look at shared suffering. To get a deeper sense of, uh, of 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 what's going on, um, in the sec in this book, there's a section called the essence of wisdom, and that personally spoke to me as a student of philosophy. Uh, when you say that to be philosophical, one must love wisdom for its own sake, accept its permanent validity, and yet its perpetual irrelevance. That part was particularly interesting. Why? Well, because, you know, in some ways, um, uh, the wise acquire insights to their lives, and, and uh, which may not be yours. And, and what they teach you may actually be true of their learning, but may not actually be relevant to you at a particular time in your life. Uh, so if you are actually impressed by what they have to say for its own sake, if you tell yourself, my God, what a profound insight into the world and so on that I never thought was possible. That's fine. Um, it may not immediately appear to be relevant to your life, your work, your relationships, but it's it's just incredibly wise in its own right. That's that's very often the case. It's not that everything you read or learn or are taught by a guru or whatever is always mm -hmm. applicable to your own circumstances. Yeah, a recurring theme in your book is to be skeptical of gurus and be careful and to double test your uh, assumptions. Uh... Did you have any personal experience or have you observed gurus leading us astray? Now, I've been, frankly, not ever attached to any any gurus, but I have seen people who are, including in, in my own family. And um, I, I do think that um, in many ways, a healthy skepticism would have done them uh, a good turn as well. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, every other human being is both shaped by and limited by their own experience and their own knowledge. So yours may be different. And in some ways, they may not know as much as you can know or find out about your particular issue. Don't always take them as the last word. Absolutely. Now, uh, in the last 10 minutes, I don't want to ask you the quotes that you've written, but I want to ask you questions that a lot of our listeners around the world are curious about because it appears to their life. Please do check out this book. I think you'll enjoy it, gifting it to the ones you love and uh, reflecting on it. Um, the fun story, yesterday we had a meetup in London and we spent the afternoon basically discussing what these quotes and ideas meant to people. And I wish you could have been there, maybe next time. <laughs> I wish I could have been there too. So, um, Dr. Thurur, most people who, who look at you would probably say that you've you're successful, you've accomplished everything. Do you feel successful? And what does success really mean to you? You know, first of all, when you said you feel successful, not as an absolute permanent condition, no. I've had successes, uh, but I see them as, you know, stepping stones, as it were. I don't feel uh, 
in, in my life that if I were to look back today and actually succumb to these various entreaties to write an autobiography, which I've always resisted, even though various publishers have asked me to do so, um, I don't think I would look back on a life that has on the whole been successful. Mm. In fact, I've had some rather well-known failures and setbacks in life, including um, um, losing the election to Secretary General, which at the time of my contesting it, I thought was almost tailor-made for me, and I, I uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, because I'd had a career that touched on everything a Secretary General needed to know. Uh, and I thought I would be the one person who'd come into it fully prepared, but I didn't get the job because it's not about the best resume, it's about the political considerations of the, of the five permanent members that really matter. Uh, similarly, um, um, I've had another fairly well-known, well-publicized recent setback when I ran for president of my own party and, and, and fell uh, flat. I mean, I, I think I have the dubious distinction of being the most successful loser in terms of the, the loser with the highest number of votes in the history of Congress party elections. Uh, but that's, that's all there is. Now, when you look back at all of these things, you have to say to yourself, um, you know, there's there's no sense in your life that you've come out, reached a sort of satisfactory conclusion where you can look back on a life well lived and just hail successes. Uh, so in that sense, no, I don't think my life has been a success story. Um, but I do think I've done a few useful things. I think I've made contributions. I've contributed in some ways to um, moving the needle on this national conversation about colonialism's impact on India both within India and amongst the Indian diaspora, and to my surprise, in, in British public opinion, when the book I, I wrote became a bestseller, and a lot of conversations in England changed uh, around uh, the question of how they regarded their empire in India. All of that, I thought, was, was, was good to have happened, and I was pleased to have that behind me. Now, when I look objectively, as it were, I can be objective, um, at sort of the mileposts of my career, I can see why people would say, hey, the, look at the success, he did this, he did that, the youngest PhD, the youngest undersecretary general, all, all sorts of various things that people can say, oh, what successes. But as I say, I, I, I never really took any of them as opportunities to rest on laurels. They were things one had accomplished that would enable one to do more and better at the next stage. And, um, and somehow that more and better hasn't quite fully come, but I'm still plugging away at it, Utkash. Uh, but you, but why? You say that he who has a why can figure out the what and how. Why? No, because, you know, as a human being, I've always, always uh, felt very sincerely that uh, the only purpose for us to be on this planet is to make a difference. I, I asked myself this question as a kid. You know, I mean, everybody who's born has to die. Um, I mean, what's the point? Uh, and it's a question most of us at some point or the other in our lives are forced to confront. I, for whatever reason, asked that to myself very early. And, and, and my answer was obviously that for having been here, you should make a difference in the lives of others and make things a little better uh, for, the, for, for others. And that I'm pleased to say that I, I um, in, in some small ways, have been able to do. I, I think that whatever I've involved myself in, I have done it with enough commitment, dedication and passion uh, that I have made something of a difference, whether it's as an MP, whether it's as a UN official, whether it's in dealing with refugees, handling the Yugoslav civil war. I mean, I, I don't think that any of those things uh, have been unaffected, as it were, by my involvement in them. And that's something that I can look back with satisfaction. But, but I don't have in, inside me a sense that my sort of purpose in life has been fulfilled. My my Purushartha, as we say in, um, <laughs> in, in, in Hindu thought, I, I'm not quite ready for Vanaprastha yet. Let's <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, Do you agree with Machiavelli when he talks about power and leadership, that a leader must be feared or loved, or do you think of leadership differently? No, actually, I think it was very differently. And that's something I didn't put into the book because it's not a totally original thought. I came across it in a translation of a Chinese poet uh, a few centuries before the birth of Christ, in which he said, you know, he didn't use the word leader, he used the word king in those days. So he said the, the, the worst king of all is a king who's feared. Uh, the next worst is the one who's loved by everyone. The best king of all is the one who, when he accomplishes something, the people all say, we did it ourselves. And I thought that was such a perfect uh, reflection of my own philo philosophy of leadership, because I've always believed, even as a, as a manager or a leader uh, in my own work, that you have to make your colleagues, your team, your workers, your subordinates 
stakeholders in your success. If whatever you accomplish is all about you, then you actually failed to do that. You have failed to, to actually get people uh, to feel invested uh, in the work. And for me, uh, my, my job as a, as a leader of my department of the UN, for example, was to motivate people to feel that sense of involvement that, to my mind, was the essential defining element of doing any job properly. I would always tell you, I mean, I was running the Department of Public Information. I, tell, I told people, you're not here to do a radio show. You're not here to write a podcast. You're not here to, to design a poster. You're not here to issue a press release. You are here to make the world a better place. You are invested in the UN success. And these small things you think you're doing are part of a much, much larger design that will make the United Nations more effective in making the world a better place. And I must say, I, I had lots of people come up to me later and say they'd never thought of their jobs that way before. And, and that was my message to them all the time. So for me, these are the ultimate things. Always keep a larger vision, a larger goal. Why are you here? Why are you doing what you're doing? What's the purpose you're trying to do? Years later, I came across uh, a story which I believe someone the Purana as I read it, I read it in, a, in an article or a book somewhere. Uh, but it was years after I'd been at the UN. And it said something along the lines of uh, um, a, a, a king uh, who had commissioned this huge temple. And, and he um, he went there to in disguise, not as the king, to inspect the work. And he asked the stonemason, what are you doing? The guy said, I'm chipping the stone. And he asked somebody else, what are you doing? And he said, I'm you know carting uh, uh, sand and, and, and water for this. And somebody else said, and everyone described in minutiae the work they were doing. But one worker said, I'm building a great temple to the glory of Meenakshi or whichever god or goddess it was. And the king hailed him and rewarded him for having always been motivated by that sense of vision. And I thought it was a fabulous story which confirmed that my instincts weren't entirely unrooted, as it were, in, 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 in great men's thoughts. Then the last question, because I know you have to run for a really important meeting. Uh, Dr. Thiru, are you happy? And do you think happy to happiness comes from looking forward to the next adventure, looking back at a past adventure, or just staying in the moment with whatever we have right now? <laughs> with Kush, I am always happy because I believe that it's a privilege to be alive on this earth uh, uh, and to be getting a chance to look forward to something new every day. So in that sense, yes, I'm happy. I'm existentially happy with everything that I see around me in my country, in my party, in my constituency, in my work, in my writing, in my books. No, of course, there's areas of discontent, areas you want to change, things you want to push. So it's not happiness in the sense of some sort of um, fatuous contentment with, with everything uh, that we are in the best of all possible worlds. We're not. But I'm happy to be able to give it a chance to live in this world and to try and have a crack at it. And I might add, with Gush, if I may, that, that for me, um, happiness has to come from within you, ultimately. <clears throat> it's not something that can be imposed from outside. I think I may even have an aphorism saying that because I believe it very, very strongly. If you are constantly dependent on external sources for your happiness, you will end up being miserable because other people and the rest of the world and the outside world will sometime or the other, if not always, disappoint you. Whereas if you find within yourself your sense of purpose, your sense of, uh, of, of motivation, your sense of what you look forward to and your sense of what you need to do to fulfill your goals, then I think you will be happy in that sense of the term. Uh, as I say, you can't always be happy with everything, <clears throat> but you can be happy within yourself as you strive to make everything better. Thank you so much, Dr. Thu, for writing this book and for reflecting on the important ideas that you advance. I encourage everyone to check it out. We'll put the link uh, once the podcast is live. Have a wonderful day, Dr. Thu. See you. Bye. Take care.